Okay, well, it's 10.30 time here in Iowa. Welcome, everybody. My name is uh, Jack Deckers. I'm a faculty member in uh, animal science, animal breeding and genetics, and the lead of the, uh, the field day component of the Agriculture Genomes to Phenomes uh, um, initiative. Um, and today, uh, our seventh field day, we have uh, Teddy Prayoga, who's going to be our uh, featured speaker. Uh, Teddy is a data-driven growing specialist at uh, Let's Grow in the Netherlands, um, which is a data platform that was founded about 20 years ago as a spin-off of Wageningen University. And Teddy is originally from Indonesia uh, and uh, did his uh, master's of science at Wageningen in uh, green, greenhouse horticulture and physiology. Um, and he's now part of a, a team um, that is uh, trying to bridge the gap between research and, and practice, specifically with regard to the greenhouse industry uh, and, and data science. Um, so if you'll, you'll tell more about uh, uh, the concepts behind that and uh, about the team. Uh, but the team recently uh, launched the concept of uh, the data-driven greenhouse uh, at Tomato World in the Netherlands. Uh, Tomato World is uh, um, is the information and is an information and education center in the greenhouse district in the Netherlands, which is in the southwest part of the Netherlands, close to uh, Rotterdam, which is the the largest port in Europe. Uh, I visited there um, two years ago with a group of uh, animal science students from Iowa State visiting my home country in the Netherlands and. Um, as part of that, of course, it was mostly focused on, on, on livestock industry in the Netherlands, but to also give them exposure to the, uh, uh, the horticulture industry, we visited Tomato World, and it was very impressive, and I would certainly, if you get a chance, to uh, the opportunity to visit Tomato World, I would certainly encourage you to do that. Uh, the greenhouse, this, uh, greenhouse horticulture is very important in the Netherlands. It's a very important uh, component of Dutch agriculture. Um, and remarkably, uh, Dutch, the Netherlands is the second largest exporter of agriculture products in terms of value after the US. And that's quite remarkable because uh, the Netherlands is about a third, one third of the size of Iowa, the state of Iowa. Um, it has seven times as many people living in it. Um, 17 million compared to two and a half million, which makes the population density in terms of people about 20 times as high in the Netherlands as in Iowa. Yet it exports a lot more ex product, uh, uh, agriculture products than, uh, than Iowa does, and only second to, uh, to in the world compared to the US. And one of the ways it does that is by having very intense production and the greenhouse industry is a, is a very good example of that. And uh, so that's what we're going to hear about today. Uh, please put your yes. um, questions in the chat. There will be a couple of breaks uh, where we will go through questions. But if there's a question that is relevant to what Teddy is talking about at the moment, I'll interject the question. So yeah, keep the questions coming in the chat and uh, hopefully uh, we'll enjoy the, you'll enjoy the presentation and learn a lot. So Teddy, I'll turn it over to you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jack Deckers. Uh, uh, and, uh, and Nicole Scott also for uh, inviting me uh, in this uh, yeah in this opportunity of the seventh field day of agricultural genome to phenome initiative. Uh, today I'd like to uh, take everyone, uh, the audience, in an uh, yeah online tour. Unfortunately, uh, hopefully in the coming time when uh, yeah COVID gets better, then uh, you can experience the greenhouse yourself and maybe come to the Netherlands, come to Europe. Uh, yeah, uh, right now I am in the greenhouse of uh, Tomato World. Uh, here we will learn about what is uh, data-driven growing in the context of production. Uh, the healthy emphasis is in the context of production and this data and collected numbers via sensors uh, need to be uh, practical and really shows uh, what matters for the grower because sometimes when you look in the point of view of researcher, uh, we are talking about uh, sometimes different numbers, and that's why uh, Jack already mentioned that uh, our team at Let's Grow is trying to really bridge that gap uh, between what is what can we do in research 
but also what is uh, practical, uh, what the, do growers need to think uh, in, in the field and what numbers could they work with. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit about uh, that. Uh, here I will show you also some examples. And yes, as I as mentioned before, my name is Teddy Playoga and uh, I am a data driven growing specialist at Let's Grow. And before we begin with my short explanation, I will, uh, we will try to watch uh, a movie. Um, for those who haven't watched it, uh, this is in Netflix. It's a documentary, uh, this is uh, a short clip documentary uh, from uh, Sir David Attenborough. Uh, this is not going to be about animals, uh, but uh, there's a little bit of a, um, a small clip, which is quite interesting, and it's only about two to three minutes long. Yeah, here's my next slide. Uh, this is a very classic graph uh, from a researcher uh, from Wageningen University as well, uh, Cecilia Stangelin. Uh, she was one of my teacher uh, back then. Uh, what you see in this graph is uh, different types of uh, growing system, uh, ranging from open field to a fully closed uh, greenhouse. And we have two crops here. That is tomato, the red bar, and then sweet pepper. Um, yeah, after 20 years of research, uh, uh, after 20 years, actually this research uh, remains very much relevant in today's figure because uh, especially considering uncertainty of uh, climate like rain and uh, pest in, uh, infestation in uh, an open field system. And that is why in such open field system, we can only realize uh, yeah, such low kilos compared to a uh, high tech greenhouse in Holland. And also at the same time, uh, using uh, less water as well. And this is really due to a lot of uh, factors uh, playing at hand together. When I said about high tech uh, greenhouse, because uh, we really have a lot more span of control compared to what we see here uh, in open field in Spain or Israel, for example. So yes, the more uh, uh, span of technology, uh, so the more control that you can have, the more parameters that you can think of that you can uh, do something about. So for example, uh, in the closed greenhouse, you can even control the amount of CO2 which is very important for photosynthesis process of the plants. While in the open field, of course, naturally, this is something impossible. So, for example, uh, light, free light source like sun often used uh, to set strategy for the whole year, for example, like uh, how we can realize more stem density of higher leaf area index uh, in the summertime because we have uh, more light. Uh, also, when adding artificial light, uh, usually depending on the type of crop, uh, this can be used to extend photoperiod, for example, uh, to trigger uh, your plants to flower or uh, to inhibit uh, your flowering, for example. It really depends on the type of crops. Uh, lighting is generally used to compensate uh, uh, winter time uh, here in the Netherlands, at least. But uh, we are uh, working also with some of the clients uh, that doesn't necessarily need uh, artificial lighting. Uh, but the main point that I'm trying to bring here is actually that uh, in such system, be it uh, using artificial light or not, it is usually very high in light use efficiency. Also water, uh, because uh, in the greenhouse system, uh, we almost recircula uh, recirculate uh, yeah, 19 to 95% of water uh, being uptaken by the plants. And sometimes in a very closed system, even uh, the transpired or the evaporated water from the slab or the, uh, uh, from the soil uh, and from the leaves that is actually being recaptured uh, and then uh, reused uh, for irrigation. And that is something quite uh, fascinating. And of course, in the open field, this is also something that is uh, yeah, almost impossible to do. 
and also due to the protection of the structure, uh, there is very little to non-use of chemical protection agent. But of course, this is very much uh, dependent on the type of the crops uh, in general. But uh, we also, for example, in tomato world here, we try to also use uh, uh, yes, biological enemies to protect uh, from pest infestation. And that is also something interesting to see because you wouldn't expect it in such uh, a closed greenhouse because you think there would only be the plants inside it. But actually, there are also a lot of other things going on, like, for example, bumblebees or uh, yeah, those uh, biological enemies as well. And uh, of course, the other factor that we are going to talk about in this context, that is data different growing. There is, uh, yes, a lot of sensors as well. But I will come back to that later. And of course, uh, with that being said, highlight the uh, use efficiency, water use efficiency, um, we can realize uh, more uh, controlled and year round production because then eventually we are not really bound to uh, the temperature or the climate outside. For example, in the winter time here in the Netherlands, uh, I think uh, history wise, that was also the case, uh, right? Uh, Jack, maybe uh, you had your own experience in the past. Like, have you uh, visited greenhouse uh, during your uh, youth or? Yes, yes, I did. Yes. Yes. So I can imagine it's actually very handy during winter time that you can still produce uh, yeah, fruits and vegetables, and then you can also provide um, and even export it eventually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's that's the because it really goes back in time the greenhouse horticulture uh, in the Netherlands it uh, it was really goes back in time from the 1930s for example it was really uh, uh, like part of the way of the living especially here in the Westland area in which you also saw in the uh, Sir Tenboro uh, uh, short clip before uh, there was an aerial shot view. Um, and it was actually taken from, uh, yeah, it's, it's a top view of Westland, basically. Yeah. And how is it possible? I think I need to launch. I have a little bit of a question for the attendees before I uh, carry on. So, yes, again, we have talked about um, how uh, many kilos can be gained from greenhouse horticulture in the Netherlands, but what is actually the key factor uh, that causes it? Yeah, we have uh, several answers coming in. And I think you could also see it in your screen already, perhaps, <laughs> or not. I don't think so. I think uh, you'll oh, have okay. to end the poll and then share. OK. We'll do that in one moment. I still have some answers coming in. I will just uh, end the poll anyway. Uh, share result. Okay, it's interesting. Um, so most of you think that uh, it's technology and innovation uh, because also we are uh, in this uh, uh, yeah, field day, we are going to talk about data-driven growing. It sounds very technological, of course. And of course, the technology and innovation part and the experience part also uh, not completely uh, wrong or, or not even wrong, even in that sense. However, uh, the, the real key of, uh, I will stop each result. Um, what you see here is several logos. So that's actually, uh, yeah, I will explain a little bit. Okay. Then. We have a lot of research going on here, technology innovation. However, actually the real key uh, of the uh, Dutch grower success is actually information and knowledge sharing. And you might be surprised why am I emphasizing on that? Because like, yes, of course, uh, uh, you can have a very sophisticated technology. You can buy the most powerful machine, but actually 
without the so-called uh, working together or in Dutch, uh, as you like to call it, summer working. <laughs> so it's actually really uh, the foundation of, uh, of, of why the Dutch agriculture is, is really, um, yeah, we can call it leading the world maybe even, uh, at least in this sector. Um, yes, and, and why uh, did I emphasize on that is also, um, uh, it, there's a story, for example, uh, imagine you go in a classroom in which you are uh, learning about uh, a growing strategy of tomato. And sometimes in that classroom, you actually can find two different or two competing tomato growers sitting in that classroom at the same time. And they are actually sharing their strategy. And this is something not in every country uh, being done, so to say. Uh, for example, uh, I also work with some clients in Canada and when uh, yeah, the Dutch grower talked to them about, yeah, we are sharing data, we are open to each other and they are, well, you are opening your data to your uh, um, competition. Oh, that's not something that we do. So that's, that's what I mean by uh, information and knowledge sharing. It is very, very strong uh, here in the Netherlands and it's also being encouraged by the uh, yeah, Ministry of the Agriculture and Food. And that, that's also um, yeah, part of the reason actually Tomato World exists uh, because there are a lot of support. There are, uh, the people are really eager to work together. Uh, and yes, that's why we are in this point, I think. So what is the next step? Well, the next step is what we have been waiting for, I think. So that's the so-called data-driven growing uh, that is going to be the core essence of, uh, I think, this tour, this field day. Um, so again, uh, Jack already uh, explained to us uh, what is Let's Grow and Tomato World itself. So Tomato World is a hub of knowledge and uh, that works among others with Let's Grow. And Let's Grow is a data platform that helps uh, growers uh, collect data through sensors and different types of technology. And we are, oh well, Tomato World is located in Westland area and also Let's Grow actually, but uh, in general, Westland area is a very big hub of uh, horticultural, uh, a greenhouse horticulture delta. All right. Um, I will show one more movie. And uh, I will also here in this video shortly introduce uh, the managing director of the Meta World, Miranda van der Ende, and also our CEO from uh, Let's Go. So there's no sound, Teddy. No sound. No. Let me repeat that movie. Okay, I think. The world is facing quite some challenges. We have to make sure we can feed the growing world population. But this is not easy due to climate change, water scarcity, and the growing demand for healthy food. The solution is data-driven automated growing. With the help of sensors, cameras, and robots, we can monitor crops 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we add to that smart controls and algorithms with artificial intelligence and expert intelligence to control the optimal circumstances to grow healthy and sustainable food. And here at Tomato World, we show that it's not the future. No, it's happening right now. In Westland, the famous glasshouse district of the Netherlands, Champions League players from the horticultural sector have set up a data-driven greenhouse together with Tomato World. We transform Tomato World into a living field lab for data-driven technologies. Here we test and demonstrate revolutionary innovations. It's a unique project that shows visitors from all over the world the future of greenhouse horticulture. Book your visit to the world's ultimate innovative data-driven greenhouse on tomatoworld.nl. All right, so I suggest uh, to visit the website, of course, to uh, check more about Tomato World. And of course, uh, when uh, situation allows, 
uh, Tomato World is also a, a showcase greenhouse. So basically we are allowed to have visitors. Um, so for those uh, who are located in the Netherlands, uh, don't hesitate to uh, come around. Too. All right. Um, so that's a little bit about the data-driven um, greenhouse uh, in Tomato World. Well, I have talked about a little bit about uh, knowledge and data sharing as the uh, yeah, as the main power of Dutch horticulture. Uh, and now that knowledge and data sharing is getting more uh, and more accessible for everyone and also for growers. Uh, when we started uh, with Let's Grow 20 years ago, we were really using the first technology of internet and we were building a model for a Gerbera grower and just asked them, okay, do you want to store your data in the internet and at the time uh, they said no well what are you going to do with my data so they didn't believe us at the time and then uh, well as time progresses of course uh, technology also progresses and now it's actually uh, really on demand that people are really trying to uh, build their own data platform even so uh, we were lucky. We also started really early in time, especially in the horticulture field. And at the time, really, we were a part of Wageningen University, but, but because we went commercial, so then we had to come up with another name that uh, let's grow. And yeah, what uh, is shown in this uh, picture here is uh, really we, we work with different uh, uh, sensor suppliers, for example, Gearbox, Workit, or Sage. And based on this sensor, uh, these sensors have their own speciality. For example, Gearbox provided the cameras or uh, some other provided the uh, measurement for the light, for example, or the temperature or uh, the slab weight, or uh, yeah, we can name anything that really we can measure. And then based on that, the data is collected. And then those collected data can be used uh, as a set point input. So basically in order to make a control. So for example, imagine in a very hot day, you want to open your window or your greenhouse window a little bit. You want to fend out uh, your relative humidity from the greenhouse. Uh, you want to also keep your plants a little bit cool. So that's how you, uh, yeah, based on this data, it's all something possible to do these days. Um, yeah, even the next level, uh, if you see underneath here, those of the collected data is also visualized and can also be uh, yeah, optimized in the end of the day, even with artificial intelligence and machine learning, we can uh, make some kind of a, a yield a prognosis, for example. And this is also very handy, especially in this uh, in times of COVID like this, for example. So uh, imagine that uh, the greenhouse is in Canada and then the crop advisors sit in the Netherlands and it, it is just quite impossible to travel a lot. So uh, this kind of data exchange and information uh, in, the, in the dashboard is really handy for uh, those people to work with. I think uh, I already gave uh, really a lot of information Check. <laughs> is that true? So maybe we can try to uh, yes open up. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So is yeah, any... please please put your uh, questions in the chat and as they're coming in. Um, question I can I, I'd like to raise is uh, you know obviously the Dutch greenhouse industry is uh, very efficient in terms of use of resources, but. What about the economic side? Is it cost competitive compared to you know, open field growing of vegetables? That is a very good question. Uh, I think in terms of um, kilos, where, because you also saw that in the open field, imagine you only uh, realize uh, per, uh, say per, per square meter, you make about uh, four to 10 kilos maximum of tomato crop. And then in the greenhouse system, you produce about 60 or 70. And actually economic wise, uh, I have had a talk, uh, this talk actually with a grower. And then they said, uh, the margin is the same, but then uh, the, the initial cost is lower, obviously in the open field, uh, but depending on that uh, technology and how you grow the crops, because 
it doesn't stop in technology. That's also, uh, uh, yeah, why data is important because when you have the structure, when you have the building, uh, you still need that uh, ability to grow the good crops. And that's where it counts, I think, in, in terms of return. But there's also uh, a new system. Well, there are, this is getting more and more popular, uh, vertical farming, so fully indoor system. And for, for that system, that's a little bit different. That's even more um, span of control, obviously, also. However, also a lot more input like electricity price uh, that cannot be uh, like in the greenhouse here, we still use the, um, the free energy from the sun, for example, and that really makes the difference. And, and uh, also, but this is only based on my personal experience. So maybe in the audience, there's also someone who knows a little bit more, for example, uh, that vertical farm, as far as I know, is not yet uh, uh, really uh, give you a proper return, so to say. Well, for this greenhouse system, the fact that it's there, I think uh, it's actually giving you a lot of profit. And especially when it's applied here in the Netherlands or uh, in, in colder country like Canada, for example, or uh, uh, in Scandinavia even. It's, it's really useful to apply the system. Yeah. Good. Well, I don't see any questions in the chat. Uh, doesn't okay. mean that uh, what you're sharing is not uh, informative. It's been very informative, uh, yes, but I think I think I think it's been clear. So, oh, is there a question? Yes, I have a quick question, Dugan. Yeah, go yes. ahead. Yeah, my question is: uh, I believe this is a way to go for the uh, agriculture to somehow uh, increase the productivity uh, and meet the need for the future, but. My, my question was, uh, what do you think is the, um, what I call it, the uh, period of uh, investment? For example, uh, return. I believe this technology requires a lot of investment. And yeah. in general, uh, how long do you think we have to wait to get the return from this investment? Is it a year, two years, I mean, 10 years? What is the yeah. general period in, in your experience? Yeah, from as far, uh, as, far as I know, uh, it usually range from two to five years. It really depends. And it also really depends on the market and the location of that greenhouse as well. Now we are even working with a lot of uh, clients who is uh, like, for example, located in India or Indonesia. Uh, and the market there is a little bit different than, uh, for example, those who enjoy salad in, uh, here in the Netherlands because uh, us, the Indonesian, we don't really eat salad that way. So it's also a little bit uh, different uh, depending on the type of the market, but usually ranging from three to five years, really. But uh, when you're talking about data-driven growing, uh, even next level of investment is that uh, the, there's a greenhouse that is already a lot of uh, experience. So imagine uh, they have been growing the way they do uh, for the past 20 years, growing tomatoes. And now we are trying to take them even to a next level by relying on data also, rather than only on their experience and their way of uh, their knowledge of growing uh, crops. And it's really working. We have a lot of uh, uh, some study case example that, uh, that prove that that really improve uh, the yield. What is the most uh, important um, measurements, the, the most important data, that, and or perhaps most surprising uh, data that you collected to, to, to maximize um, the, the economic return? Yeah, I think uh, that's a very good question. And the answer, I'd like to answer it with one thing or two things, but in fact, it's uh, combination of multiple things at the same time. So imagine you are trying to produce a good uh, kilo of tomato and it's actually really a combination of good lighting, also good realized temperature, uh, good realized real relative humidity. And also in the end of the day, uh, yeah, uh, for example, watering system and also uh, 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 the fertilizing and all these uh, complicated things and, and 
that is also why, oh, by the way, this is a really nice uh, bridge to my next topic. Uh, now I will also already also uh, launch another poll. And please, if you look at the poll, um, ah, yeah, there are a lot, uh, quite some people who already heard about uh, growing by plant empowerment. Okay. And there's another question in the chat, but I, what I suggest is that uh, we, yeah, you go on and because some of the questions that are raised also in the chat, okay, get, get into some of the details that I think you're going to talk about and so, but we won't forget about the question, but yes, maybe uh, okay. better to uh, have you continue. Yeah. Okay, I will just end the poll um, and share the result. So uh, yeah, most of you don't really know what is plant empowerment. So growing by plant empowerment is actually developed by, uh, again, uh, association of researcher and uh, experts in the field of greenhouse horticulture. And I see, uh, well, some of you already know also, that's, so that's nice. Um, I will just stop sharing, so yes. And yeah, growing by plant empowerment is actually trying to emphasize Okay, we have sets of equipments, really complex equipments. We have the greenhouse, we have the watering system, we have the slab, we have the lighting system, we have uh, uh, the misting system, or we have uh, even the, the window opening, we have the energy screen, we have everything. How do we control that to achieve, uh, yeah, to, to grow the crops, to uh, uh, really uh, yes, uh, earn that kilos? But actually, yes, the, the answer is not that simple. So that's why um, uh, based on the sharing and uh, information sharing in the Dutch horticulture sector is actually, um, yeah, plant empowerment was born from, it was, it was born uh, uh, into 2016 actually. Uh, and before really, it was long ago for 20 years under the name of Hatnew Taylor. Uh, and it was really translated into literally into next generation growing. So there is uh, a belief in which this is how you grow crops uh, in green fingers way, but actually the next generation growing it is really trying to emphasize, okay, there's this scientific way in which you can uh, work with, for example, improving your light use efficiency, your water use efficiency, uh, enhancing your plant health, production and uh, actually this uh, growing by plant empowerment principle was introduced uh, internationally uh, two three years ago almost uh, 2018 so uh, but the main um, yeah the, the, the really uh, uh, the main difference of this uh, principle is that it put plants as a focal point and emphasis on uh, bridging between research and practice so Next slide. Yeah. Um, so yeah, GPE uh, or, or growing by plant apartment. Uh, we can call it GPE. GPE consider a plant uh, and greenhouse energy balance. And uh, what does that mean? Uh, it really means considering the balances uh, of this uh, balance principle, considered plant assimilate balance, for example, or water balance and energy balance. Uh, of both the plants and the greenhouse. So, for example, uh, water balance, meaning in the left side, there will be water uptake. And in the other side, there will be, for example, transpiration. What does it mean to be balanced? Uh, that it means that you really have uh, to work with those two parameters to really see. Uh, there's the term uh, that Dutch grower really like to use, that is crop activation, uh, crop activation or crop activity that it really means that uh, the water uh, really flows in the xylem of the plants. And it's, it's, it's really uh, something that, that, uh, yeah, that is wanted, so to say, in plants for, uh, for the sake of the plants to grow well. And that's only one factor, uh, and that's only one picture, so to say. And then for the rest, for example, energy balance, there are also a lot of things that I can talk about, but I think I'm not going too much into that detail. 
And I also suggest that uh, to check out the uh, yeah the website. If you uh, just click uh, in Google plantempowerment.com, you can find more about uh, these principles. Yeah, and uh, plant empowerment also, uh, yeah, already I mentioned a little bit, uh, taking into account complex uh, greenhouse cultivation technique. So that's why uh, there's uh, the picture of the puzzle because it's really more than one factor playing at hand. Uh, uh, yes, so you can really work with a lot of parameters and what we usually do uh, in plant empowerment is that uh, we sometimes also lose track of what's going on in the greenhouse. So what grower needs to do and with uh, plant empowerment, we usually emphasize and say to them, okay, don't change a lot of things or multiple things at the same time because then you wouldn't recognize anymore what's going on and why. So that is also uh, why uh, this is important for growers to work uh, with this tool and to work with uh, based on data. Um, yes. And in the tomato world, for example, uh, we have a really, it's actually a very small uh, greenhouse. So it's considered small because it's actually uh, only a, a showcase greenhouse uh, rather than greenhouse for production, which usually can be about 10 or 20 hectares. It really depends. But we also have uh, really a lot of varieties. And this is uh, some examples of the uh, tomato fruits here in the tomato world. And these are also uh, some examples of the sensors that are hanging here. And these sensors really measure different things. And I will, uh, yeah, I will, I will try to go through uh, them one by one um, in the next, uh, next slide. Okay. So um, quite complex, but this is basically what is now uh, the sensors that are available in the tomato world that you can see uh, live if you are here in person. Uh, but anyway, I will just show uh, it to you in this way first. And then later on, uh, I will try to walk around with my camera uh, in the greenhouse uh, in the row and then try to show you uh, the setup that I'm going to talk about uh, here. Uh, let me check if I can have a laser pointer. Uh, can you, can, Jack, can you confirm if my laser pointer is visible? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, so this is, so to say, the data-driven growing sensor set. Uh, there are a lot of things going on here. Uh, so please focus first on, yeah, we, we have several, really a lot of measurement, but I will now get rid of the plants. Now, please focus on the top left here, where my pointer is. And that's actually the meteor station, which is located outside of the greenhouse. So what it does, uh, it contains of a lot of different sensors, as you can see here. There, uh, it's uh, built from a uh, multiple sensors. Uh, and there are, for example, Pirano meter and Pirigel meter, and this is to measure the temperature and relative humidity outside of the greenhouse, uh, to measure uh, wind speed, for example, and wind direction, and also precipitation. This way. And it's also measure, of course, the uh, yeah, incoming radiation from the uh, Pirano meter. Yeah, and then also we have the PAR sensor. If we go back and Yes, the PAR sensor, these two, these are the light sensor that measure uh, the light photon between 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. And that is the, yeah, the so-called PAR or uh, photosynthetically active radiation sensors. And then let's go to the aspirator box. We have three aspirator box here. So they are, uh, what they do is they measure uh, temperature and relative humidity inside the greenhouse. So actually it, it really is really a box literally because it covers the probe uh, of the measurement uh, so, so that we can have a more accurate measurement. 
and uh, yeah they will have uh, uh, no influence from for example the sunlight or uh, the pipe for example and then we have three here uh, it's simply because uh, we also look at absolute humidity so for example we calculate the absolute humidity uh, from inside the greenhouse based on these aspirator boxes and also compare it to the ones uh, above the screen and that way we will know if the difference if the absolute humidity in the greenhouse is very high or higher compared to the above the screen and outside for example then it means we have a driving force to really uh, throw out the uh, moisture from the greenhouse and if it's too moist inside the greenhouse it can be quite harmful as well for the crops um, yes and uh, this is a special item but i will just still uh, introduce it anyway so uh, it's it's a combination of multiple piranha mirrors actually that measures the incoming radiation from the sky so we have one layer I will just make an invitation. So we have the first layer, the second layer, and the third layer here. So you also saw that uh, in the picture before, we have uh, a high wire crops or uh, a tomato crops, which is quite tall. So ranging uh, from three to four meters. And that is actually also the, the main purpose of this piranha meter ladder is actually to really measure the light penetration on, on a different canopy level. So for example, for this layer, for the first one, we are trying to uh, really measure what is really incoming on the top of the crop or on the head of the crop and in the middle and then also in the fruit level really down below. I will also show you uh, a little bit later in the presentation. So Teddy, there's uh, a question in the chat that I'll interject yes. here. Um, question is, what is the use of uh, the weather station on the outside of the greenhouse? How is that data being used? Uh, yeah, a good question. So actually uh, for multiple things also, because we measure obviously multiple uh, parameters as well. Uh, so for example, uh, I already mentioned about the absolute humidity uh, because we also, ha we have, three aspirator boxes here which measure the temperature and uh, relative humidity and eventually we can calculate absolute humidity and it's also there's also a probe temperature probe here that measures the same thing and actually sometimes when uh, the grower is trying to get rid of uh, extra moist in their greenhouse they sometimes have to really look okay outside my greenhouse there's this amount of uh, absolute humidity so that it means I can discharge this much moist and also for temperature difference for example so you can see oh, okay outside is really cold so I really want to uh, screen uh, my greenhouse because I need to keep uh, my crop uh, not too cold so that's that's really, really the use of uh, that's why we have the outside meteo station and also the inside sensors I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And we also next have the gear sense cameras, which is the orange um, camera here, too. This is like a uh, yeah, security camera, it looks like. But uh, what it does is really also in two different levels we installed it. Uh, so on the top, uh, it we will be able to see, uh, yeah, what is the condition of the head of the crop and well here we usually are, are trying to also observe and um, yeah look at the condition of the fruits and also uh, gearbox they are really working hard in uh, developing algorithm in order to um, predict uh, fruit ripening speed and they're trying to build model based on this uh, camera so basically uh, yeah they, they can really okay uh, make a prediction in which point in time uh, when the growers are able to harvest their uh, fruits and it's really something uh, fascinating and the next thing is I'm going to have this here in the slab uh, the wet sensors 
it's called wet because it literally measures three things at the same time. So water content, W, uh, water content, EC of the water and the uh, slab temperature. So wet sensor. So those three are really important parameters in order to, uh, yeah, to, to know your dosing of fertilizer and also uh, to really work with your, um, uh, yeah, with your watering uh, and you also make sure to supervise your whether or not your rooting system have sufficient water and then we will go to the plant uh, infrared temperature the plant infrared temperature also is one of the important sensors it measures uh, an average area of uh, leaf and we will uh, come back to this uh, plant infrared temperature in the later slides. But uh, what it does, it measures the temperature of the leaf specifically. And also the thermal camera, this one on the right hand side. We'll just go back one slide. Yeah, so the thermal camera is uh, yeah, something that we can also work with to, to, uh, to really look at the difference um, in temperatures uh, or, or the so-called uh, climate uniformity in the greenhouse, because even though you have a closed greenhouse, uh, the, the climate or the temperature around it is really uh, different per area. And this is also some information that sometimes uh, is needed by growers. So for example, um, the difference between the temperature on the head of the crop and the below part where the fruits are hanging. I will come back to that later. All right, I think I gave a lot of information again about the sensors, but this is basically what is, uh, yeah, the, the sort of the basic setup that we have here in Tomato World, and we are also working with different uh, people and clients as well, growers that are uh, applying uh, the sensors in, in practice. So that's also the interesting thing. Uh, we are thinking that, hey, it's a very uh, technological greenhouse. Uh, can you actually, you know, there's also already a question about, can you actually make a return out of it by installing all of those sensors? But actually they, they really do uh, yeah, work more efficiently even in this way. And uh, also the idea in the coming uh, time is actually we develop a lot of uh, uh, different algorithms to, to make uh, self decision. So for example, uh, to, to set up set points for controlling uh, the window opening or the screen opening or the uh, watering system. And what, if that is able to be automated in the coming time, then actually the grower will visit the greenhouse or will need to visit the greenhouse less and less. And for example, with today's case, like uh, the tobacco mosaic virus uh, that is spreading in Canada, for example, they are really afraid that their tomato crops uh, uh, yeah, are, are dying literally, and and uh, and they are really uh, not happy with happy with having people coming around, walking around, uh, back and forth inside the greenhouse. So it's actually uh, a, a great solution to really have less people uh, to visit the greenhouse. And also, uh, well, uh, uh, Jack already asked me in the beginning of the presentation uh, whether or not. Uh, are the workers in the greenhouse still there in the greenhouse? Actually, uh, yeah. When we are, when we have some, when we have our own eyes that we can check from our phone or computer, then we don't need to be here to uh, make sure that uh, all crops are doing fine. So that's also uh, the main concept behind the data-driven growing. So there, there was an earlier question from Hans Schapers. Maybe that's, this is a good time to ask that. Um, could you describe the crop model, the crop model that is used used to manage the tomatoes or peppers? And are, the, are these from Wageningen University? And are the parameters uh, publicly available? Uh, yeah, some of them are because actually some of them are again funded by, I already mentioned in the, first, uh, the beginning of my presentation that some of them are funded by the 
a ministry, a ministry actually. So it's uh, some of them are really uh, open public access. So some uh, of the research result is actually accessible for uh, yeah for everyone. Uh, but it really depends, I think, uh, because you can also talk about uh, uh, some specific models. Uh, uh, for example, the ones that we use, I don't think so, at least. <laughs> But uh, for, for the other ones that, for example, uh, that is uh, worked by uh, different organization outside uh, of my work, I think they are quite available as well. So for example, I showed the website of CAS Alls Energy Brown. So if you also click that on Google, you can, uh, yeah, you can find different types of uh, um, research result uh, that you can read uh, but I'm not sure if it's in English. That's uh, that's the only uh, my only concern. So so the, the so the crop models that the system uses were they are they um, internally developed? Uh, it, it I uh, it's really complex answer because it's mixed. So some of them are some of them have their own. So, because we also work with clients who, okay, this is ours, so you need to lock it only with ours because, uh, okay, uh, again, with the, the GDPR in the Europe, uh, we are really um, yeah, bound to rules and we have uh, to really protect the data of our user. So, basically, some that are open, it's obviously accessible for everyone, but some which are not, then, yeah, okay. it's a different thing. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, so the next uh, uh, yeah, measurement, the next input, we also work uh, other with than, uh, than with sensor is that uh, we also measure the, for example, the, the, the parameters that we observe in the greenhouse uh, using uh, an application for our phone. Uh, for example, we look at the thickness of the crop head or looking at the fruit quality, we can also take pictures and take videos, etc. And the growers can register this data and then it will send immediately to the dashboard for them to uh, make analysis. And this is how the dashboard looks like uh, for Let's Grow. Uh, so this is uh, on the left, oh sorry, on the right uh, top. A corner, you can see the picture. This is actually uh, an example of a picture that is taken by the GearSense camera. And you can see here, it's a little bit small, but uh, you can also choose different angle and different position in which the camera uh, can take pictures. And so then uh, you can also, well, from a distance, look at your crops. And this is also the measurement from the sensors, for example, because we collect really a lot of da data. It is really needed we have, that we have, it is necessary that we have a system in which we can uh, show and unshow also the graphs because uh, it can be really messy when you uh, show everything at the same time. Um, so it's a question of, of, also a little bit of uh, management of data, but uh, yeah. With, with all of the sensors that I just mentioned, I think uh, you can imagine uh, how many data per, uh, per, per, yeah, per second per, or per, per hour that you can get. And some of the sensors measured, for example, per five minutes, some of them measured per 10 minutes, some of them even per second. So it really varies per technology. Yeah, uh, I will show you some of the application example. I think it's a, a good time to really look not only, uh, okay, I've been talking about different types of sensor, but how do growers actually work with it? Okay, I already talked about the difference between uh, the temperature of the head of the crop. And what you see in these two pictures is simply, uh, this is a picture taken by the thermal camera and because a high wire crops is really tall, uh, usually three to four meters. And what you see here on top of the crop is that it gets really cold during the night because it loses um, yeah, uh, 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 heat, it loses enthalpy. 
So it emits a long wave radiation to the sky because of the really high difference between the greenhouse temperature and the sky temperature during the night. Uh, and imagine in that case, uh, you really create a, a cold spots in your plant and actually it really, uh, yeah, stop the activation, uh, stop the crop activity, so to say. And this is what uh, growers uh, don't like. And usually, uh, in order to work with that, uh, we use the screen uh, to at least uh, mitigate that difference between the head of the crops and the lower part. Oh yes, you see here in uh, in, in the red uh, rail, it's actually pipe. Uh, it's very red because it's actually emits heat and it's like radiator in your home, for example. It's like a yeah, it's, it's too warm the greenhouse basically. In case uh, you are not aware, yeah, and that's why the difference between the top and the bottom part is very high. Okay, uh, still we are talking about screening, and this is actually just a random data that I took uh, between May 10 and May 13 in Tomato World itself, here in the in this very greenhouse. So what you see here uh, is that what I already talked about, uh, only in graph. Uh, so you see here several uh, icon. I can tick and untick this uh, to really uh, just observe what I want to see. So for example, okay, I'd like to see the temperature of the greenhouse. And there was also a question about, okay, I want to look what is the temperature outside the greenhouse. So we can really compare also those uh, numbers in these lines. And what we see here is actually, uh, it's not very optimal because uh, in the in the in tomato world, we only have uh, one type of screen, and that is a blackout screen. And when you have uh, this kind of blackout screen, when you close it too much, and when you close it, just just in general, it will uh, naturally block all the sun. And uh, because this is now approaching summer, uh, we have sometimes light until uh, nine o'clock or ten o'clock. So that's why uh, we have this a uh, little bit uh, weird. Um, yeah, screen closing, because you usually just close up to 100% immediately. But what we do here is we do it step by step because uh, yeah, we want to still uh, to have some light. But it, it really differs also for growers how uh, they approach this uh, in that sense. And what you see here is also the orange line is the long wave radiation that I was talking about. And you see when we screen, the moment that we screen, uh, so this is long wave radiation is measured uh, from the meteo uh, station. So you see there's a sensor that is facing down. It was rather small, but uh, there, was a, uh, there was a sensor that is facing down and it actually measures the long wave radiation that is coming from the greenhouse. And that is also uh, the reason why the a result of the measurement is minus because it, it depicts that it uh, goes up. And what you see here is when we screen, it immediately uh, gets uh, yeah more stable, so to say. It gets uh, really less and less. While here, for example, when it's really open, it's actually, uh, yeah. Uh, and this can create uh, quite some problems as well for the crops. And this is one example already um, uh, in which you can work with data. And if you are a traditional grower, there is almost no way that you can see this just by looking at the crops. So that's why it is actually important. Uh, yeah, data can go. Okay, the next example. I showed you the sensor of uh, the so-called uh, light uh, Pirano uh, mirror ladder. And that's actually, uh, yeah, uh, three layers of sensors. And now what you see here is simple, simply the radiation measurement. So this is the orange line is measured from uh, the meteor station outside. And this is what is, uh, intercepted by the plants and you can see here it's about it's already only about 60 percent so you can imagine uh, that the glass of the greenhouse uh, really decreases the amount of the 
uh, yeah, incoming radiation from outside. And this is also what I already mentioned in the first, uh, in the beginning of the presentation is that, um, yeah, we try to maximize the light use efficiency. And actually in this way, we also get a lot of information already, I think. Now, if you see, for example, in the uh, middle measurement, so the blue line and the green line, Oh, apology. I think I made a mistake with uh, activating the graphs, but uh, anyway, uh, those um, the green and blue lines are the, they are the middle part of the measurements. And you see that uh, it's even a lot less compared to the red lines. Uh, and that really says uh, that in the middle of the canopy or even below, you really have a lot uh, less of, uh, yeah, you really receive a lot less light. And that's also part of the reason why some of growers uh, use interlighting, for example. So they also install light in between uh, their rows to really maximize their photosynthesis as well. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, so, for, uh, for example, that can be used uh, to. to uh, in order to, for example, to you apply interlighting, but also uh, when we measure the leaf area index of the plants, uh, we can also uh, try to uh, make a decision of the leaf pruning strategy. So for example, maybe under the canopy, we uh, just, we don't really need that much leaf anyway, because we receive a lot less light compared to the top part. And this is a little bit the art of uh, working with uh, yeah, high wire crops. And of course, for example, if you are talking about other types of crops like uh, lettuce or basilic, basil or yeah, other leafy greens, uh, that's going to be, uh, th this is not applicable at all, what I'm talking about. Yeah. So another example uh, is that uh, I showed already also the plant uh, temperature sensor. So this plant temperature sensor really measure uh, the average area of uh, the leaf. So based on this leaf temperature, uh, we work uh, with a number uh, with a number called VPD, vapor pressure uh, difference, and it is expressed in uh, kilopascal. So actually, uh, the VPD is simply uh, yeah, the difference between uh, vapor pressure, a saturated vapor pressure of the known temperature, and also based on the known uh, relative humidity, uh, we can calculate also the actual vapor pressure. And this VPD here is not only cal um, calculating the difference between the saturating air and the actual vapor pressure, but actually, uh, I also mentioned already about the plant temperature. And this plant temperature is used also in this formula to estimate uh, the pepper pressure of the plant. Um, uh, I call it to estimate because actually, uh, in this case, we are trying uh, or we also uh, we, we almost always assume that the plants is a uh, wet bulb, so it has uh, yeah, one hundred percent relative humidity, uh, but uh, yeah, it's just to make things uh, quite simple, actually, and practical. Uh, but what you will see based on that uh, calculation is that we can estimate the plant uh, VPD. So that is the difference between the vapor pressure of the plant and the vapor pressure of the air in a given time. So that vapor pressure difference really shows uh, the driving force of the leaf or the ability of the leaf to be able to transpire water or to get water out of their system. So what you see here, uh, the black line and in the green area is a little bit uh, a rule of thumb in, in which uh, yeah, we somehow agreed upon the, between the Dutch grower that is, uh, between uh, uh, 0.5 to, to uh, 0 0.2, I'm sorry, uh, to uh, 1.5 kilopascal. So that's a little bit the rule of thumb that we set that, okay, when it's between that number, it means that my pepper pressure difference 
uh, is in the safe zone, so to say. You can see here, for example, during the midday where uh, the sun is really high. Uh, in this case, uh, you see that the relative humidity really drops and this causes the PPD to be really high. And this is not favorable because it means during this time, this point in time, uh, that the air or the, um, uh, the microclimate of the plant is really dry and it will, um, yeah, meaning that we have too high uh, driving force uh, of the transpiration and actually plant have their own mechanism in which uh, they will be able to protect uh, themselves. That is by closing their stomata. So uh, in that case, uh, yeah, we will stop that, uh, the so-called crop activity that I already uh, mentioned several times before. So this is uh, also one of the examples that we can use uh, in practice. Uh, of course, when, we, uh, when I show this to growers, um, some of them are really, okay, how do I work with this number already? So that, that's also why uh, uh, this is a little bit our role uh, is, is to really, okay, how can we simplify uh, all these models, all, all this calculation that we are working with? And this is just one example, by the way. Uh, how can we actually use it in research? And sometimes also it needs to be as simple as possible. And that's also a little bit the challenge, I think, uh, yeah, in data-driven growing still. So there's a lot of uh, potential. Uh, but anyway, uh, with this number, we can really know the, the crop activity. And it really means that maybe in this midday, uh, maybe I need to, uh, uh, for example, close my window a little bit in order to uh, keep my moisture uh, in the greenhouse. For example, that's that's one example in which uh, they can work uh, with these parameters. Yes, I think uh, I already uh, mentioned quite some uh, example already, and uh, yes, I can uh, talk more and more, of course. But uh, I think we only have uh, uh, a little bit of time left, so, so I will open uh, up a question. I think because I already gave so many uh, information. Yeah, the question that I have is, um, of course, we're, we're primarily geneticists. So are um, crop genetics companies, are they using these data systems? Yeah, very good question. Um, actually, they are uh, really keen on uh, getting a lot of uh, phenotypic data uh, because, uh, for example, breeders um, and seed, seed suppliers, because for them, uh, sometimes they are really focusing on creating uh, new uh, varieties, new varieties, but in the end of the day, uh, you also need to test it in the field. And sometimes um, some of them don't uh, always uh, cope that good, for, for example, in different environment. For example, it was tested in the Netherlands. And then when uh, we take it to Kazakhstan or uh, to Asia uh, or to Indonesia, for example, they, they behave differently or... Uh, they suddenly have this uh, uh, a truss bending, for example, for tomato. And uh, this, this is kind of a, a problem that, uh, yeah, we are facing uh, together, basically. Uh, so that's why uh, your question is very good because a lot of, uh, indeed, uh, people who works in genetics really are uh, keen on uh, getting all this data as well. Mm -hmm. However, uh, I think the main challenge is to really uh, to get those data because sometimes there's just simply uh, not enough um, uh, yeah, resource, time or labor or uh, yeah, way of getting those data easily and quickly and effectively. So that's why uh, this is, this is uh, still, uh, I think our main challenge is in data driven growing also in general. So are, are breeders using it to uh determine what the optimal control strategies are for a particular variety? I mean, for example, you talk about the, the vapor pressure difference that you can control, but I mean, I, I could imagine that different varieties may have a different optimum. Yeah. Do, do breeders use, use that uh, yeah. to, to optimize? Uh, yeah, that's, that's also why uh, I told you already that uh, actually they are very keen on getting this phenotypic data because uh, for example, 
so, sometimes their their uh, aim of breeding new varieties as, is as simple as okay, I want to have a more tomato spur truss, so then labor can easily uh, pick it up from below, so they can just harvest in one time. Uh, small, unimaginable things that oh, when I talk to the uh, supplier. Uh, supplier i was also quite surprised because this is something uh, sometimes or at least uh, we don't really see and these problems they, uh, they, they they really address and that's why the phenotypic data are really interesting for them so that they can identify more um, what kind of demand actually what is needed in the coming uh, yeah time to breed okay. uh, new varieties good go ahead, go ahead. Can I, can I, I have a quite good question uh, from the data science uh, perspective. We do some, uh, we, we at uh, South Texas, we are trying to develop a model to predict the yield in the future. So in order to do so, we actually generate, develop a digital twin of the actual agriculture. But um, in order to, uh, just from the optimal optimization side, um, we try to um, raise different crops at the same time with different conditions with uh, humidity, waters and uh, uh, irrigation and, and, and then minerals and stuff. But uh, in order to generate this AI model that we do uh, need the uh, labeling, labeling of all the plants, uh, say, so to speak, we have about uh, 200, 300 different uh, pots and uh, having difficulty of uh, labeling and capturing images to synchronize the phenotyping, pheno, uh, phenomic data with the yes. actual data. So do you, do you have the same problem uh, in your, in your um, greenhouse for e labeling? How do you, how do you, if you do the AI modeling, how do you solve this problem? Uh, I think that question uh, is for us a little bit less applicable in the sense uh, that I already uh, emphasized ahead before that uh, in production we have different priority. Uh, so that being said is that we are trying to, of course, try to get as much as data possible. Uh, we try to uh, phenotype the crop also as much as possible. But of course, this is in at the cost of uh, using extra labor and also uh, shifting your uh, focus from, for example, what really matters for production uh, to what is needed uh, in research and in uh, taking uh, decisions. Uh, so, but, but I do understand um, uh, what uh, you were saying about, okay, uh, uh, problems with labeling. Of course, it, it's also something that happens to us a lot of times as well uh, but however uh, i have to be honest that uh, we take a lot less samples or we try to uh, do as much as possible or we try to compromise in between uh, then uh, the good statistical uh, or, or the optimal statistical um, approach uh, while at the same time uh, practical approach so that's why uh, i emphasize in the beginning of the presentation always that we try to bridge that gap because the gap is real and, and it's, it's just really quite, uh, yeah, it amazes me sometimes also personally. Uh, but, but I do hope I answered your question, but uh, um, yeah, uh, for example, uh, I can also mention that uh, with the GearSense camera, uh, we are trying to work uh, with Gearbox uh, uh, to, to, to try to look at the, uh, uh, these 2D pictures actually, because so far, um, it's quite complicated, especially in practice, uh, is that we try to take uh, pictures of fruit, for example, and then we try to, uh, uh, to, 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 to make a model, uh, for example, for the fruit weight or the, uh, or, or the fruit shape uh, for ripening that is maybe quite uh, doable already in this uh, time, but uh, in the coming time, there are really a lot of uh, things that we are trying to also optimize, so to say. Uh, so, yes. Do I, uh, am I answering your question though? I'm afraid the- uh, well, Yes or no, but yeah, I understand what you're saying. Uh, yeah. I mean, a little different point of view, but uh, I mean, 
<laughs> we just have to find out the best way to achieve our goal. So thanks for the comments. Yes. Oh, uh, you're muted. Sorry, we have about 10 minutes. So maybe you can take us yeah. live into the greenhouse for the remaining time. And then if there's additional questions, yeah, please shout them out or put them in the chat, but. All right. One moment, I will try to share my screen. Yes. Okay, I'm in a greenhouse. Oh, one moment. Everyone can hear me because I'm changing my audio system. Yes. This is uh, Tomato World Greenhouse. Teddy, we have a lot of interference of something clicking. I don't know if it's coming from your phone. I will just uh, show quickly where the sensors are. Because I think uh, also the connection is not that good. Yep, these are the different uh, yeah, varieties of tomatoes.
can also see the aspirator box above the screen, and uh, when the screen closes, it will be uh, really close the uh, structure of the greenhouse on top. So it will be either act as a uh, energy saving or blackout screen. Okay. Yes, unfortunately, I cannot uh, go deeper in the sensors. But what I can do is that, uh, yeah, I, I can uh, maybe send some more uh, pictures or videos because uh, at least uh, in this way if, uh, <laughs> it doesn't work live. So. All right. I think uh, we still have some time for questions. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay. So um, thanks for that. So uh, in a in a commercial greenhouse, because I can, I mean, you show the uh, the difference in conditions between you know low to the the ground versus versus up high. But I can also imagine that uh, conditions can be quite different in different uh, different parts of the greenhouse horizontally. So so. Um, how how many yeah how, of course that affects where you have to uh, uh, place the the sensors but is that I'm, I'm assuming that's a big issue. Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, it, it really depends on the uh, size of the structure. And, uh, and so really we can't, we, I can't hear you. You cannot hear me. Test test I can test. Hear you, oh. Can I... What about the rest? Maybe. Uh, okay. So, I still can't uh, hear you. You can't hear me. Oh, let's. Uh, hear. Uh, okay. Uh, but anyway, I will just try to answer the question. I think. Uh, Nicole, can you can you hear Teddy? Yeah, I can. I can hear Teddy. I I pulled up our PowerPoint so that maybe you can read his answer. <laughs> maybe it's strange, maybe it's me. Can I hear him? Okay. Uh, yes, what well, I am, uh, uh, I already forgot the question, but anyway, uh, it really depends on the size of the structure and the project, of course. And for example, I also mentioned uh, in a different system. Uh, so for example, when you also grow different crops, like lettuce, in which uh, you only have a growing bed, and it's not, uh, yeah, you don't really need uh, sometimes that high of a structure that uh, so that the design uh, or the placement of the sensor uh, can be adjusted. But generally, uh, these sensors are also built for general purposes in which it can be adjusted uh, quite flexibly uh, for different types of system. I don't know if uh, you heard my answer, but. <laughs> yes, I did. OK, yeah. OK. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Are there other questions from the uh, from the audience? Okay, let me check the chat. Okay, well, we're almost out of time, so uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank Teddy for a very interesting uh, uh, demonstration of what uh, what's possible in a greenhouse with data and. Um, you talk about the data uh, sharing, knowledge sharing, which, of course, we're uh, that's a big part of this uh, AG2PI initiative is sharing our knowledge amongst each other. Yeah. Uh, but it's also very important to share that knowledge with our stakeholders, right? And that's you know, I mean, the, the key aspect that uh, um, that you're focusing on is how to bring this knowledge to uh, to the growers and to have them share knowledge and to uh, use data in the optimal manner. So um, it's very interesting. So thank you very much for uh, for taking the time and sharing uh, this information. Thank you very um, much for having me. Yeah.
So just to uh, wrap this up, so uh, on the screen you see um, the, what's coming up in terms of AGTPI. Um, so as usual, we'll have uh, every Wednesday of the month. So this will be June 16. We'll have our next field day. And then tomorrow there will be a training workshop on introduction to SNP data analysis. And in June 24th, there will be a, a workshop on GWAS and TWAS. So uh, sign up, go to the website, uh, ag2pi.org to sign up if you're interested. Uh, and um, if you have any comments or if you have any suggestions for future field days, feel free to uh, uh, put them on, put those on, the, enter those on the website. There's also a Slack channel that will be associated will be open for this field day if you want to continue some of the communication with Teddy uh, or amongst each other and um, with that I think I'll close it off and thank everybody thank Teddy in particular and Nicole for the technical assistance and thank you all for attending and have a good rest of the day thank you have a good day thank you very much